Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. Welcome to another episode of the Career Musician Podcast. Today's guest is none other than the silent partner, a.k.a. Daryl Simmons. Daryl and I were in the airport in Narita, Japan, and we were able to catch up and do this interview after a little tour with Babyface uh, back in late 2019. So thank you, Daryl, for making this interview happen. I am extremely grateful, and I am super excited to bring this information to you all. Please enjoy this episode of the Career Musician Podcast with none other than Daryl Simmons. The Career Musician Podcast. I am here with the silent partner, Daryl Simmons. Yes, sir. <laughs> and we're in the airport in Narita, Japan, headed home from a long trip. Daryl, well, thank tired. you so much. You're welcome, man. Yeah, yeah. Try to squeeze this out for you. Thank <laughs> you. Before I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a long flight. A good 10 hour yes, nap. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yes, good nap. So, um, look, I don't want to, you know, bombard you with all the typical questions because obviously your history, both musical and life experiences, is, you know, rich, full of many stories and, mm-hmm. and things like that. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, I know you and Kenny Edmonds, a.k.a. Babyface, go back to childhood. Yes, sir. If you could Long maybe way. just touch on that, like the abridged version of that, how you guys grew uh, up. In, well, in actually, bands. I played in a band with his older brother who played guitar, right. Michael Edmonds. And we played. I played drums, wow. and the band was an instrumental band. <clears throat> and I used to feel like we needed a singer. Mm-hmm. you know. And I had heard that his little brother... Kenny could sing. I had never met Kenny. And I would bug him about, hey man, why don't we get your brother? And his brother was like, nah, nah, we don't need to get him. Nah, he ain't really that good. But I kept hearing through school that he could sing. One day, we were outside back in those days in Indiana. You practice in a garage and people would hear you and come by. And Mm -hmm. so this particular day, we had rehearsed outside and I was breaking down my drums. And up walks this kid with a guitar, an upside down guitar with five strings on it with two other guys. And uh, he said who he was, and I said, oh, you're Kenny. I said, I'm in the group with your brother. He goes, yeah, I know. And from that day, wow, 47 years later, wow. here we are. So Look we hit that. it off, never separated <laughs> since. That's amazing. He was eighth grade, I was ninth grade, I think. And that sounds like such a brotherly thing to do from Michael to say, nah, we don't want Michael. Oh, yeah, of course. Brother. Suppressing <laughs> the younger brother, <laughs> right. who was clearly more talented, right. and he was suppressing it. No, he's better than me. I don't want y'all to see him. Uh, and finally, I saw him, and I saw why Michael awesome. suppressed, because he was, when I first met him, I said, wow. He, to me, he was like a kid genius, us being kids. Mm. You know, I love music, but this dude was like well beyond whatever little talent I thought I had. That's and so, interesting. Uh, there's a the, one of our childhood friends used to say. He said to me one day, he says, "You want to make it in music? Just stick with Kenny, cause he's gonna make it. So stick with him." Wow. And I was like, I always remember that. 
Don't you love those affirmations? Yeah. I see, it like, won't leave your mouth. Oh, it never has. Yeah. It never will. And I remember him saying, he was just our, he wasn't even a musician. He was just wow. the neighborhood dude. But he knew he could see in Kenny with Kenny always playing guitar, walking around, writing right. songs. He could see that in Kenny. And he knew I played music. And, you know, we started hanging. He said, you want to make any music? He said, stick with him because he's going to make it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I think he's going to make it too. <laughs> So so I know a little bit of the story. I know about Manchild. I know about The Deal, of course, and things like that. W what was the first permutation that you guys hooked well, up? Well, that particular day that I yeah. met him, they asked me to play drums with them because they were more Kenny and a guy named Emmanuel Officer. They were more my age. We were like uh, same. Kenny was a year younger. Emmanuel was the same grade as me. Michael, his brother, was older, and he hung out with older guys. Mm. So Kenny and I and Emmanuel, we were more alike. I adapted to them. It was more of a harmony, okay. more of a fit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so they asked me to play drums, and on the spot, I think I quit <laughs> and joined <laughs> their band. Kenny's band. Kenny's band. Yeah, wow. they, they had a band called The Elements. The and Elements. so I joined their band to play drums because they were more, like I said, it, they were more like friends. They were more like mm. my type that I would hang out with. A I didn't hang out with the other guys. Yeah, I didn't hang out with his brother. Uh, his brother, they were older. A little too old. They were, yeah. Even though they weren't that much older, right. like by two years maybe, but, but back I didn't then, vibe with it. Yeah, I didn't vibe with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as far as playing or hanging out with somebody. Right, right. Wow. So that's how we ended up. So the elements, them. how long did that live? All the little bands never lasted long. Okay. Then you start another band. Okay. It wasn't until high school that we had a real band called Tarnished Silver that became our first real band where we, we had a pain gig. First of all, that's what, what a cool name. We stole it, actually. <laughs> really? We stole it from a guy. How did, Actually, how did that come about? It was a guy we were working with, and he was much older. This guy was probably 10 years. You know, this guy was already just an older guy working on music. And it was actually Manuel's cousin, a Manuel officer. It was his cousin named David Officer. So he would take us with him to the studio, and he would kind of show us around the studio. And he was an artist, and he was working on his own thing. So he would use us to sing backgrounds, and of course, Kenny, to help him formulate the songs because Kenny played uh, wow. guitar and it was David who had that name called Tarnished Silver and we just outright stole it we just started <laughs> using it <laughs> in high school and we kind of got famous off of it in high school that's awesome we played the you know the homecoming dances I was gonna say I've heard you guys yeah. talk about this so you started playing all local local gigs mainly high school okay. dances okay and then from there we did colleges Indiana University Purdue Ball okay. State because, you know, in Indiana, just did the college a circuit. big college circuit. Yeah, but it was yeah. good. We were we were making, like, a little little pocket change Decent for money. ourselves on yeah. the weekends. Yeah, it was a good band. Wow. Cover, you know, cover songs. we throw in some originals. Kenny was writing. We were writing, you wow. know, little, little love songs, and we throw those in. So you'd mix it up with covers and originals? Yeah, 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 for sure. We had original songs, We because we were always writing. Kenny, so I, you and, and Kenny Emmanuel. started writing together oh, yeah. already early? Oh, yeah, early, right. early, early, early ages, yeah. You know, Kenny was already writing. He kind of brought me into writing. I wanted to be a writer, but Kenny really, you know, opened that door and made me see, okay, wow. this is this is how it this is how it's got to go. It's the longevity you know? of it. Oh yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. He was always the you know the, the primary person or always the the writer. Wow. It's actually how I became a co-writer because he would always have the ideas, and then I would kind of come in on the idea. And how did that look? Like, what was your involvement? Was it lyrical? Lyr lyrical, always been lyrically. Melody. Both, okay. Both, yeah. early on. But Kenny would usually always have it, the format. Which, mm. And I would say my role, I'd come in and connect the dots, help him connect the dots. Mm. But it was already there. You could see it, you could hear it. And then I would come in and jump on it and just kind of help finish it out. It's interesting because you still do that today. It's what I've always done. That's I've known role. you for 12 years and you always yeah. come to the gigs and you, you're an, uh, an outside observer yeah. and then you Musically. come in and you tell Kenny and myself, yeah. hey, look, what you know, maybe you could do this or, you know. So. Yeah, that's kind of been my role. It's been good. Uh, it's been comfortable. I mean, I write on my own away right. from Kenny. Okay. I've done things on my own that have been successful, but my what I love most is being his co-writer. That's mm -hmm. what's fun because it's a fun process that he and I have and have had since childhood. Because wow. it's not just writing. We sit there and remember what time we were yeah. at somewhere and we stole this meat. Or oh, remember that time we were somewhere? So we, we sit there and write and right. reminisce. And next thing we know, 
we've come up with some great song during the process of uh, writing. So it's a fun process that we have. Right. You know, that's been the same, just so you know, for those 47 years. Different wow, location, whether sure. it's a closet, garage, basement, eventually getting to a studio, right. but the process has always been the same. It's never changed. Amazing. Never so changed. that you guys just had that synergy from day one. It just connected. Yeah, it's like we speak the same way. I know where he's going. Once he lays it out, I go, okay, yeah. I see where you're going. I feel you. You can almost feel the words come, the lines, the melody come. Right. It's like, it's almost like how they say twins, they can feel something with each other or, because you know, Kenny and I are born a day apart, April 10th, April 11th. Wow. So we're very similar in a lot of ways, different right. in some, but very right. similar in our thought process. Wow. So that was the other thing. We just have never fallen out with each other, never had a screaming match, never cursed each other. Never had? No. Wow, the fact that you guys have never butted heads on that level mm -hmm. is because incredible. Because I think we've been so similar. It's like, even outside of music, we sort of like the same kind of movies, the same mm -hmm. kind of what's funny to him is funny to me. You know, it's yeah. that, that, yeah, yeah. that sort, of, sort of thing. You yeah. know, we can hang because we know each other. We're not going to hang long when it's time to go. Right. ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. I, just, I love know? that about you guys. Yeah, it's not, I'm, it's so not that I'm going to be there sitting there drinking a beer because yeah. we both don't like beer. Right. So, <laughs> it's, you know what I'm saying? You might have a little wine or something wine, move on. And, move yeah. on. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's always worked. Right. Even working and even not working. So it's been a very comfortable, great friendship. That's incredible. You know, yeah. Now, how did you take on the moniker The Silent Partner? How did that the Silent Partner out? came from when the Face Records was started, and I was writing a lot with L.A. and Kenny. They were the producers. Okay. I wasn't a producer at the time. I was only a songwriter. Uh, and so, but I was writing all the songs with them, but I wasn't producing. And so people would see my name on the records, but they would never see my face or see me physically because they were doing all the promoting and all the dinners and all the award shows. Really? They were doing that. So you wouldn't even attend those? Oh, things. yes, but people didn't know me. They just didn't know. Yeah, but oh. at one particular award show, somebody met me and said, Daryl Simmons, oh, so you're the silent partner that we see. We see your name, but we never see your face. Wow. You're the silent partner. We thought you were a ghostwriter. We thought they made you up. And I was like, no, I'm real. It's just that I'm in the background. Wow. And so that's how Silent Partner came about, and I ended up adopting it. And right. you know, when I started my company, it was like, hey, call it Silent Partner. Yeah, and well, you have your publishing company, but publishing now you company. have a, a, a clothing line as well, right? My son, Silent Merch. OK, so I call it Silent Merch and bringing back the old Silent Partner logo, and he's so selling cool. online merchandise from the 90s right just kind of nostalgic stuff. yeah you gave us some of that swag thank yeah, yeah, you yeah. so much oh, I love yeah, this it's, just, it's a great it. logo it's yeah a great it's logo. totally my cool. brother actually uh, along with my sister Renee McNeil designed the logo okay and so it's just a great logo my, my son would start wearing that stuff to school and people were like what is that what is Simon uh, Park it's such a cool logo you should sell that you should sell it and so he came to me one day, oh, Dad, everybody asked me about this old stuff. You should sell it. I said, no, you should sell it. I, said, I have no interest. Incredible. So I gave him the platform, right. funded his little Venture, online store. Yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, now you turn it into something if you can. So it's doing well. But that's what Silent Partner. That's awesome. So, so Silent Partner as your publishing company and your... your Silent Partner is my can, production company. Your production company. And I built a studio and I named it Silent Sound. Silent in Atlanta, which is a famous studio that so many, from Puffy to Beyonce right. to everybody's used it. Which I want to get to. A crazy so, studio. Perfect segue. A crazy studio. Talk about that. Uh, I left LaFace Records to kind of, you know, leave the nest and see what I could do on my own. Yeah. Kenny and L.A. were doing some things separately, and I kind of felt like, oh, it's time for me to, you know, f see what I can do. Okay. I've been with these guys for so long, and I appreciated all they had done. They took good care of me. I made a lot of money, wrote a lot of hits. Right. I said, well, I just want to see if I can do something on my own. Yeah. So I left LaFaced and bought a building, didn't know what I was going to do with it. Probably three years later, ended up building a state-of-the-art studio uh -huh. that became a very famous studio. Uh, a funny story is we built the studio and we were going to have a grand opening and I had a box of color brochures that yeah. we were going to pass to people and we never used them. 
because people found out about the studio and started using it and word of mouth promoted it. You didn't even need the brochures. We never had it. We never used the brochures wow. or had a grand opening because people heard about it because it was like the greatest studio in the city at the time. Still pretty up, pretty up there to me. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Wow. Yeah. So, and everybody that you can think of is Britney Spears, like I said, Beyonce, CeeLo, wow. Andre 3000. Puff. You name it. Yeah, everybody's been through there, man. Wow. It's a great, great, we spent more time designing it than it took to build it. Wow. Because I wanted it to be so perfect. And I had taken all these notes from other studios, you know, Record Plant, Illumba, all the studios. We had made all those great records in, Record Plant, mm. and I put all those things that I liked about those studios into my studio. So it took a long time to put together, but the end result was it was perfect. Perfect. Wow. It, re it really was perfect. Incredible. Is it still, still up there. and running Still today? up and running, yeah. My engineer ended up buying it from me years ago, okay. Tom Kidd. So he's been running it and just as a manager, but still people come through there, man. Wow. I'll run into people. Hey, I was at your studio last mm -hmm. week. I'm like, well, it ain't mine, but mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> nice, yeah. But they remember it as Shoot, mine. Next time I come through yeah. to Atlanta, I want to visit. Yeah, you should. Yeah. It's a great place. It's a great. It's not big. Okay. But it's a great. It's a great room. Elton John comes through there and books it for two months at a time. You know, That's something I want to see. Being a career musician is more than just gigs and sessions. Are you a career musician? Find out on the Career Musician Podcast, streaming everywhere. Help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up. Please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Want to learn more about a particular topic? Tag at the Career Musician and use hashtag Career Musician to let us know what you'd like to hear. You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast by Nomad. heard you discuss you know your relationship with Elton John over time and and, mm -hmm. and it, it seems like you guys were really close yeah we're good you, friends you became good friends by working together and he how lived. did that happen he just booked the studio one day I got a call and said actually LA LA Reed called me says hey do you want to work with Elton John and I thought he was kind of pulling my leg I'm like yeah well, you know what's this about you kind of messing with me no 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 I just wanted to do you want to work with him he said I got a call he said I recommended you to go down to, I think at the time it was called Purple Dragon, a student, another studio. Mm -hmm. He said to meet him. I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. He's gotta be kidding me. Yeah. So I go down to this studio and I walk in this room. Daryl, Elton, so you wanna work with me? I'm going, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Wow. So I worked with him. It was a play he was doing. I can't remember the name of it. I'll have to think of it. You could probably look it up later. Okay, sure. So I was working on some music for a play that he was doing. And he actually, now what people don't know is that Elton met his partner, David, in Atlanta. That's how Elton John ended up living in Atlanta. He met his partner and eventually married his partner, David, in Atlanta. So he spends a lot of time. He has a place in Atlanta. Okay. And so we work, and sometimes Elton will call me, Darryl, tacos, my place, nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Elton. <laughs> Daryl, dinner at Chops, nine o'clock. I'm like, okay, Elton. How cool is He'll that? call, Daryl, I need the studio. You think you could boot somebody out and get me in there? I say, anything for you, Elton. I say, let me call you. Let me call you back. How awesome is that? What a great guy. One of the greatest friendships that I made with people wow. that I work with. And mainly because he has so many great stories. I just sit there and listen to him talk about the 70s. And Amazing. he talks about touring and you know yellow brick road and so i knew a lot of insight before the movie came out because wow. i've sat wow. at dinners and just list, listened to him tell these great stories about his career so what would you think when you saw the movie it was great i thought yeah. it was good i and thought it was put together to yeah. what you knew? I, well for what i know what i don't you, know everything but knew, yeah. i felt that it was put together wow. really really well and uh it really touched me as a songwriter to see uh how bernie Top and, and Elton worked together. It reminded me of Kenny and I. I was just going to draw that it parallel. It reminded me of Kenny and I. Thank you. So please elaborate there, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, Bernie and Elton. You know, Bernie is the lyricist, though. The way they work right. is, Elton writes from Bernie's lyrics. 
Kenny and I sit in a room together and we sort of write from the music. Okay. You know, it's everybody has their way. A little different method. Different. I think their way is much harder just for Elton to look at blind words with no melody and figure out, okay, this is going to be, you know, I'm still standing. This is going to be Benny and the Jets from looking at the lyrics. It, that's amazing to me. That is amazing. I think it's amazing. But one of the greatest people that I have ever met as far as working with that you would think would be so, he's huge. He's Yeah but so down to earth, very giving. Really? He'd give me candles, he'd give me robes. Daryl, take a robe. Wow. He's got these Versace robes. I'm like, okay, I want it, wear it, Elton, but I'll take it, you know? And so- and she could say, hey, Elton gave Elton me this. Elton gave me this, <laughs> but just a great giving guy, a great wow. giving guy. And that's what I learned about people that I work with. You learn how they, what they really are, away from concerts. When you get in the studio, there have been a lot of sessions I've just sat with people and didn't do anything because we end up on a subject yeah. like me and you are talking. Right. And they say, you know, it's like, dang, are we going to ever get some work done? Right. Okay, let's come back tomorrow. Right. But I've done that with Elton, with Lionel Richie, with, mm. you know, sit and talk with Aretha Franklin. But that's the uh, breast primer. Yes, to get it to is. Really to get know to know them, yes, another. and get them comfortable, and yeah. then they're comfortable with me. And then we always end up having making great music right but i'm saying a lot of things that happen that people don't know is you end up sitting and talking to people just mm -hmm. regular conversation and you learn so much about them that they're just like you and me wow you know mega mega stardom yeah but still human still human and you when get you to see that side of them because they drop their guard because they trust me i'm there to work for them, I'm not a. I'm a fan, but I'm not. You know what I'm right. saying? You're not there's fan no, born Yeah, there's now. no hinge, hidden ag agenda. So you end up. And I always say, every person that I work with, I became friends with them. That's brilliant. But there was a time where I actually was seeing Elton more at dinners than I worked with him. I probably wow. worked with him twice and probably had, I don't know how many dinners, wow. just out of the friendship. It right. wasn't about music. It was about Daryl. What are you doing? Having tacos at my house. Let's okay, see. I'll come. <laughs> So that's, that's incredible. The, that's the that's the biggest joy is you meet these people and you know them when you were a kid, like Elton, Aretha, oh, see, or Lionel. You're and hanging then, with Aretha and Lionel. Yeah, and then too? you meet them and you go, Man, I can't even believe I'm in the same room with this person and then you're working with them. Then you become friends with them. You go, Man, how did this happen? This is crazy. It's like a dream. That is. And that's been the greatest joy is to meet these people that were big influences that I looked up to as a kid. You know, my mom playing Aretha Franklin right. records on a Saturday morning, cleaning up the house. I'm like nine years old. I mean, we all grew up, but that's the, right. the foundation of yeah. music. And you, you could never get anyone to believe or tell you that you're going to work with them, meet that person, let alone work with them, work with and you. then become friends Hang. with them. Hang? No way. There's no way. Seeing them on the Grammys, it's like, wow, that must be nice. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That all of a sudden you meet that person. And like you said, end up hanging and becoming friends because I become yeah. friends with people because you spend so much time together. That's you talk right. about all kinds of things, Everything. very private things right. that they right. that they trust you and tell you. I met Aretha once through working with Kenny, mm -hmm. um, but she seems like a very you know I, I met her towards the end. Mm -hmm. she seemed like a, a beautiful, just beautiful spirit. person. Yeah, funny. Yeah, silly. Right but very serious when She had an intensity, work. right? Oh yeah, she had intensity. She's yeah. the only person that I tell people intimidated me. Mm. And mainly because it was who she was for so long with me being such a little kid and hearing about her for so many. Elton came during high school. Mm. Aretha came when I was, <laughs> started playing music at eight mm. years old or nine years old, I heard of Aretha Franklin. So here's this person that I can't even believe I'm in the same room, and I've got to tell her what to do. It's like, how the hell am I going to tell Aretha Franklin what to do? What was it like producing her vocal? At first, it was intimidating, like I said, because, right. like I said, I don't. It's hard to see that I'm in this seat, that I'm in control, telling her what to do. Would you? But give, she was receptive. She respected it. Okay. Would you give her more abstract concepts, or would you give her actual vocal riff ideas? No, she had her own ideas. Right, that's what that's I what thought. I'm saying. Right? So she would so, do it, and you sort of just kind of, okay, maybe one more time, or okay, you know, very sort of ginger-like because 
she already knows how to sing. This is a person that knows how to sing. Yeah. You're not telling her really anything. You're just really just kind of guiding the ship. Right. Because she's going to get you there. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. And if there's something you're looking for in specific, you can maybe ask her, and she may fight you on it. But she eventually might, might try it because she yeah. knows how to sing. And so that's why it was intimidating because this person knows how to sing. How are you going to tell a We're legend? Tell her. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. So she's that only person that really intimidated me. Mm. Uh, but I worked with her again, and I was good because I got in a call from Clive Davis. Well, Aretha wants to work with you, Daryl. She really likes you. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. Mm. So I written a song that she did, and uh, that time I was good because she called for me. And knowing that she liked working with me, I was good. As a confident, oh, confidence foundation yeah, for sure. now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was just and from a person that big. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Valid to be validated by that person was probably one of the greatest things that I did. And it wasn't so much the music that I did, it was probably the achievement of mm -hmm. being able to work and meet with that person mm -hmm. and become you know, establish a friendship with that person. Because she's probably at the top of that that mountain to me for that, people that I work with. That's right. Well, you know, I, I think she's at the top. The majority of, of us would feel the are. same. So yeah. that's yeah. like something that's so surreal to wow. me. But I'm glad I did get to have that opportunity because of Kenny, of course. Once okay. again, like you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I He's opened with her. so many doors yes, for I, myself. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. So I worked with her with him the first time. Right. We worked together. Then I got a call back. To work with her by myself, so that was really cool. So, mm. because of working with him, I got that opportunity, like most of my opportunities, wow. basically. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been yeah. cool, been good. Incredible. Let me ask you one last thing about okay. that. Would she do multiple takes? Like, how many? Or it seems like she would do multiple, but not many. I would say maybe two or three, or maybe three to five, maybe. Okay, and if five you or pushed less. her, she didn't want to do it. Okay. She, because in her mind, it, that seems, and in her mind, yeah. she knew that it was good enough. Right. That's what was strange. Right. Not strange, but a little intimidating. Mm. Like you could ask her, she goes, "Okay, but you got it." And she would say, "You, you got already it. got it." Yeah, she would tell me that. Yeah. And then you could look at your watch, literally, and you could see she'd take off the headphones and walk out. Wow. Because she knew. She knew. She within knew. those takes. Yeah. And then maybe later she would fix one thing. Mm. She came to Atlanta to fix one thing one. after she lives with it. But other than that, when she lays it, she knows that it's right. Were you comping back in those days? Yes. Like you were. But with her, okay. you didn't really. You kind of didn't need, didn't need to, to, right? Maybe a word, because she gave it to you. Her, Every take was amazing. I'm her, sure. Whitney, Tony Braxton, they oh, give it to wow. you. They give it to you pretty much in a bulk of one track in there where they just solely just like, okay, it wouldn't take much. I mean, right there, the female lineage, uh, the, the pinnacle, Aretha, yeah. Whitney, Whitney, Tony. Tony Braxton. Mm -hmm. right, those three that. alone. Yes, just, I mean, absolutely incredible mm -hmm. experiences. Yeah. Yep, Ex incredible voices. All incredible voices and all different. All different. All different. Would you say that is the one of the key things is having a unique voice? in this business to I think really so. stand out. I think it will help you. Right. You don't have to, but I think it it helps you stand out. Right. Of course you gotta have great songs. Right. But I think if you have a great voice and unique that it helps the cause. Mm. You know. Uh, especially nowadays because to me a lot of people sound alike. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes along that sounds unique, it's like wow, it gets a little more attention. A little bit of a head start. A little bit of a head start. Yeah. But really more attention because oh, she sounds different. She doesn't sound like the norm, right? You know. So, right, but right. at the end of the day, I'm a song man. So, at the end of the day, it's still about that song. I don't care what your voice is like. If that song is right, you know, it can go. When did well, you discover that within yourself? I know you said you and Kenny started writing early on. When did you finally identify? Okay, I am a song guy. This is what I do. This is going to be my life. This is it. I think it's probably when you maybe hear. Getting something recorded by somebody viable is cool, but I think when you hear it on the radio, when you say, okay, this was good enough that they play it on the radio. Mm -hmm. For a songwriter, I think that's the ultimate, what we're looking for, that's right. is to hear that song, something that you wrote. I have, a, I have a joy of pulling up next to somebody 
and something that I wrote is on the radio and just sitting there watching that person screaming into the road, top of their lungs, and I just sit there and stare at them and I just smile. That's gotta be surreal. Yes, exactly. So that's my gratification. But just to answer your question, I think it's when you first hear that song okay. on the radio and you go, okay, this was good enough for that. I think that's what, I think I'm good enough. I think I'm a, you think it when you're young, sure, but you're not really ready. Right. The songs aren't really good. You know, we always would think everything we write was great, but it was really bad. And Kenny has a thing, he says, you gotta go through the bad ones to get to the good ones. That's my next you question. Have you have to. So you, you are firmly, so you write as many as you can. You just write. And then you, you just, just keep write. writing, writing, or you writing. You just write. You just write. You just, like he said, you, you have to go constantly. through the failures to get through, get to get to the successes. It's a, it's a, it's just a crapshoot. If it were that easy, then, then everybody, everybody would, would do it. Ahead. So it's just a. How do you deal with the board, quote unquote, of people that you have to bring the songs to? Let's say you and Kenny in L.A. decided, you know what, guys, mm -hmm. all three of us agree this is a hit. Mm -hmm. Now you bring it to your board, you bring it to the label people, mm -hmm. everybody, you have listening mm -hmm. sessions, I'm yeah, sure. of course. Suppose people don't react the way that you guys thought it was a hit, so how do you deal with that? We tell them they're wrong. And then you push forward? Push forward, because we know we're right. Okay. And we would be right. Huh. There's just the confidence that we right. had. And some people wouldn't hear it. I mean, there would be artists. We'd play a song. It's like, ah, I don't really hear that. It's like, trust me, you need to do this. You're doing this. Because they don't hear it. But ultimately, they do it. And I think one of the greatest stories is Tina Turner. What's Love Got to Do With It? She said she hated it. Hated the song. Mm. But her manager, Roger Davies, forced it on her. So when she won the Grammy, she gave it to him because he's the one that pushed the song. She never did like it. It's fantastic. So that's a great story. And that is one of her biggest hits, right? Probably her biggest hit. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> when you think of Tina, you hear you that song. Tina, what's love got to do with it? Yeah, Great yeah. song, Grammy winner. Yeah. And she didn't like it. She said she hated it. And he pushed it on her. He said, you know, you got to do this. This is a hit. Wow. And she does it. It's a hit. And so she said, I'm, I'm going to give it. This is yours. I'm going to give it to you because you're the one that heard it. And sometimes people don't hear it. I love that. They just don't hear it. But I think when you're a songwriter and you're a believer in it and you know that melody is a hit melody, which I learned from Kenny, you just know what you know. Now, it may not be for that artist, so then you go and maybe pitch it to somebody else. Mm. And then later you say, hey, I played you that song. Oh, no, you didn't. It didn't sound like that when you played it for me. Yes, it did. <laughs> you just didn't hear it, so you missed out. And that happens all day, every day, mm. in all genres of music. Right, right, right. People right. don't hear it. You pass sure. it on to somebody else. It's just, it's just how the business is. Now, you mentioned something to me last week, actually, about End of the Road, that mm -hmm. initially Kenny was thinking that it would be for him. And well, he didn't he, think it in the beginning. We wrote it for Boys to Men. Oh, you did, okay. But when we finished it, it was so great and so good, he said it was too good to give them that he felt like he needed to keep it for his album. Wow. And I understood it, but I disagreed. L.A. and I disagreed. Okay. And he said, well, give me the chance to record it. And we said, okay, we'll let you record it. And he recorded it, and it just didn't have that whatever it was that magic thing. I love that. And he says, okay, they can have it. So within the three of you, you mm -hmm. have this democratic process. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Um, so, mm -hmm. so you in LA said, no, we think this, but we'll give you the shot. Yeah, that's the democratic way to do it. I mean, that's, he's a songwriter. Great. So he's an artist. Right. In all fairness, I understand it. It was a great song. Mutual he felt respect. like I can't give it away. So it happened the way it was supposed to happen. Right. Because he felt like, hey, I'm not doing it any justice. They can have it. And of course, they did it justice. Mm. <laughs> so it happened the way that it was supposed to happen. Wow. So, cool. So. Now, you and L.A. Reed and Kenny Edmonds, you formed this team and you wrote together all the time. Mm -hmm. What was your publishing like, your splits? Did you guys split everything evenly? And how did that? Uh, or was I it always a case by case? It was case by case. Okay. But it was. We worked it out. It, it, it wasn't a problem. Okay. That's Because I, I know there's two, and I don't mean to get personal. No, 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 I got you. There's, there's two schools. Of th you know, some people are like, hey, whoever's in the room working on the song, we all split it. And then there's other, because I've been in sessions like this yeah. as well. We're like, no, let's talk about well, it. Well, the fortunate thing for us is we didn't have any outsiders. It was just the three of us. It was the three of us. Right. It wasn't anybody else. Okay. So... We were friends, we grew up together, so we pretty much just had a mm -hmm. gentleman's agreement. That's cool. And everybody was cool. And it worked out cool. That's like, amazing. That's, all the, that's the only way I can tell you. Is that sure. It was, 
that's how it was. And, you know, those guys were fair to me. You know, Kenny was Daniel Lane, customer Beijing, flight 804 to Washington, Dallas, customer jocks. Cool. Please proceed yeah. to gate number cool. 31 for immediate boarding. Yeah, I know. So I wasn't asking for numbers. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Everybody right. has yeah. their, like I said, there's no right or wrong way. But sure. We felt like we had a fair way. And it was good because we knew each other. We grew up together. Mm -hmm. So there was a trust. Right. And we all sort of just kind of thought on the same, you know, right. wave. Okay. You know, for a long period. And then things, right. everybody wants, maybe somebody wants to go do something on their own. Like right. natural progression of. Sure, of life. Of life. And but for the most part, yeah, it was good. That's like awesome. I said, it was it was good. It was a good good time. A lot of great music that we wrote. It was fun. Incredible. Didn't do it for. I mean, you have to think about. There was no Instagram. There was no right. auto tune. It's just hard work every day. We worked our asses off every day. Took two days off a year. Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, that's that was perfect it. segue. I was just going to ask you, this <laughs> is the career musician podcast, and this career musician term is all-encompassing, and I wanted to ask you about that. Look, you guys came up in a time where it's different than now. Yeah. So, uh, right, uh, principles never change, right? The principle mm -hmm. of something always remains there, but methods change, right? right? Of course, yeah. Technology, what is some of the everything. wisdom that you can impart to the current generation and even the aspiring generations that want to do what you guys have done. Yeah. What have you I would say what I see this? is there's there's not the work ethic that used to be, not just with ourselves. I mean, there were other guys like Jimmy and Terry were right. hard workers, Teddy Riley, Chucky Booker, Leon Silvers, mm. uh, so many people that were great producers and working hard. And I think because technology has made it so easy, I feel sometimes that you know, nowadays people don't put as much time into the music. It's sort of flip flop. They put more time into the social media part, the marketing, the yes. marketing, and being popular, yes. and then they do the music. And I understand that that's how things have changed. But to me, I'm just a I'm a music person first, and wow. I get that part. So I would just say, work harder on things. Don't take things for granted. And once you get there and make something happen, work even harder. Don't sit back and go, oh, there was two words. There was a few words that we would never say. We made it. You'd never hear us say that to this day. Mm -hmm. we to this never, day. We'd never I say that. I see you guys work relentlessly Never still. say it. Never say we made it. Because that means that's the end. People go, oh, what's the greatest song you've ever written? I go, I'd like to think I haven't done it yet. Wow. You know, because you know, you just, you're songwriter, you write. You hope that what you write is going to be may be greater than, may not be. Even better than the Yeah, next, you may not be, last, but your yeah. work ethic or your mindset is, hey, I gotta wow. make this really good. I mean, Kenny still works that way to this day. He works very hard, like he's never written a hit song in his life. And I see it. You see it. I, and he'll and, keep and, hammering on it, he won't give up on it, he'll change it wow. and tweak it, you know? Incredible. Yeah, so, cool. Yeah. Daryl, thank you so much for thank being you, a man. guest, my friend. Thank you, man. Right. Yes, sir. Music industry, there are so many avenues to travel. Join host Nomad as he dives into the crazy world of entertainment, going behind the scenes to gain insider knowledge of how to maintain a healthy career in the music business. Empowering musicians with strategies for a sustainable career. Your value is not determined by the gig. Learn more by listening to the Career Musician Podcast, streaming everywhere. Download, subscribe, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Follow The Career Musician on Instagram and Facebook. Add The Career Musician to your Spotify playlist today. Sign up for The Career Musician newsletter at thecareermusician.com. Just a nomad, nowhere man Writing the songs in this one-man band A nomad Back this 
Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.